Cheers. Hi, everybody. Catching me drinking on a Mighty Blaze. What a surprise. I'm Jenna Blum. I am the co-founder of The Blaze with Caroline Lovett. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome again. If you like what you see here, give us a like or a follow on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube. We are ubiquitous. We have a website, www.amightyblaze.com, where we have a newsletter you can subscribe to so that you'll never again have literary FOMO. Just to clarify who we are and what we do, we are 35 as of this week, creative volunteers dedicated to connecting pubbing writers with readers in the age of COVID and beyond. Um, and tonight we are so delighted to have with us Cynthia Dupree Sweeney. I didn't attempt the French accent this time as I did in the green room. Um, and our amazing author liaison and bookseller of the universe, extraordinary Mary Weber O'Malley. Ladies, I'm so excited for you to talk about Cynthia's new book, Good Company. Um, we had a, a gin lime fizz prepared for this evening you're also dressing like a book here at the blaze drinking like a book dressing like a book cheers everybody i am going to read some bios to thoroughly embarrass these ladies and then i'm going to wink out and let you have your chat so cynthia you're up first you ready i'm ready buckle up it's you Cynthia Dupree Sweeney's debut novel, The Nest, which I know we all know and love, spent more than six months on the New York Times bestseller list, Holla. The Nest was a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writer's Pick, a Best Fiction finalist for the Goodreads Choice Award, and was named one of the best books of 2016 by People, The Washington Post, The San Francisco Chronicle, NPR, Amazon, Refinery29, and I would need more breath to even read all the others. <laughs> The Nest has been translated into more than 27 languages and has been optioned by AMC Studios. Congratulations. It's in development as a limited series. I so want to know about this. Cynthia holds an MFA from Bennington, writing seminars, and you now live in L.A. with your family. Your second novel, Good Company, is a New York Times bestseller already, of course, no surprise, and it's available from Echo and wherever fine books are sold. So everybody, you will see buy links in the chat. Um, and I encourage you to buy at least 14 or 15 copies of Good Company for your mom, for every mom you know, for Mother's Day, for Father's Day, for all the days, buy Good Company. You're going to love it. And now introducing our interviewer tonight, Mary Weber O'Malley, who I love, is a writer, has been a bookseller for six years and is currently, get ready for this, the free range virtual bookseller at large, which I is such a wonderful <laughs> and grand title for somebody who basically holds our lives in your hands, holds writer <laughs> lives in your hands. For the fabulous Skylark Bookshop in Columbia, Missouri, which is one of my favorite independent bookstores ever owned by the fabulous Alex George, who we're going to have on the blaze May 14th for the Paris Hours, his own book. Mary is also the author, liaison, and scheduling producer for A Mighty Blaze, which means without her, we would all crash and die. Mary reviews books on Instagram under the handle blurb underscore your underscore enthusiasm, and her blurbs have been featured on dozens of galleys, most recently for forthcoming novels by Alex, oh my God, Michaelitis, right? I think so. <laughs> and Anthony Dore. When not writing, reading, and reviewing books and answering my annoying emails about scheduling, Mary and her husband spend time tending their little suburban homestead outside of Chicago. Mary has chickens. Um, and on that note, I'm going to sit back and just watch you ladies enjoy your talk. Welcome, welcome to The Blaze. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you so much. Yes, Alex George gave me that title and I, I hold it dearly. Uh, so Cynthia, I am so excited to be here. We were talking a little before the live show about um, how I, I have this copy of The Nest signed by you, even though we hadn't met. Mm -hmm. And it's in my treasured bookcase here of signed copies. So before we get started with any questions, I would love for you to tell the people watching about Good Company. Um, let's talk about the book. Sure. Um, well, Good Company is the story of two married couples who have been friends for a very long time. And um, the plot sort of kicks off one morning when one of the characters, Flora, um, is looking for something and she finds an old 
a wedding ring of her husband's that supposedly he lost many years ago uh, in a pond in a theater retreat. And so the plot of the book goes on to unravel the truth of the ring and what that story means to the four main characters. Um, but what I think the book is really about is reaching that point in your life where not everything is possibility anymore. When you have to sort of reconcile the dream that you had about what your adult life is going to be with what it actually is. And, uh, and also how, how secrets function in relationships. Yeah, there is a lot to unpack here. Um, so we're going to ask, I'm, I have so many questions about this book. Uh, I just wanted to say that as a bookseller, it is my greatest joy to get copies of books, early copies ahead of time, and then be able to pave the way with my readers to get ex as excited about those books as I am. And it was certainly like that for me with The Nest. And then we sat uh, we sat and watched The Nest on our indie bestseller bookshelf and it just stayed and it stayed and it stayed. Mm -hmm. And every week we'd get that indie bestseller list and um, it, it was just so beautiful to see. Um, we just, it, it made me so excited to know that everybody else saw what I did, uh, what I saw in that book. So after this instant success and this blockbuster novel, was writing good company, did that put added pressure on you? Was <laughs> it already kind of in progress and you're like, eh, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing? Uh, how did book two feel after the success of The Nest? Uh, it was really hard. I did not have it started. I had the idea, I had the idea for a long time. I maybe, maybe I had started writing uh, some of it, but it wasn't, while I was on tour with the nest, you know, I like when I was home, but honestly, that book took up a year and a half of my life, the nest between the paperback and the hardcover, which was amazing, but it was very hard for me to um, focus on something else while my head was still very much in that book because I had to talk about it all the time and write about it all the time. And there came a point where, um, I'd see it in the airport and I would just like, my heart would kind of sink a little what, cause I was trying to get a new story. I felt like it was stalking me, <laughs> <laughs> which is real. That's not really a complaint because that's an amazing problem to have. Sure. But you're trying to stop that trajectory in your brain to focus on something new. It was very hard. And, um, I, I have a very good friend who said to me, I was sort of had finished the paperback tour. I'd finished all the paperback stuff. And I was talking to a very close friend of mine. And I said, you know, I've got to get started on this new book right away. And she said, why, why don't you give yourself the summer? Why don't you just take some time to like replenish the well? She said, don't underestimate how draining that whole experience has been. And I will tell you that talking about yourself nonstop is really soul deadening after a while. And I hadn't been able, I hadn't been writing, I hadn't been reading that much. And so I did that. I just took the summer to read whatever I wanted with no agenda and, um, and no particular, you know, work feel around it. And, and that helped. And, but still, when I, when I finally started Good Company, it took me a few months to feel connected to that book and not to be sort of observing myself from the outside. That's, that is being stalked by the book you wrote. Um, it, it makes complete sense. And I haven't heard it described that way before as far as how to transition uh, between the first book and the next book. That's, that's amazing. Well, it's um, kind of like, it's like, sort of like, um, you know, you're trying to start a new relationship and everywhere you go, your ex-boyfriend's there. <laughs> that's a perfect, perfect way to, to show that. Yes. So you did get started with this. And when I opened this book to read it, that very 
first sentence sets everything up without having any idea of where you were going with it. I mean, it's a brilliant first line. Flora wasn't looking for the ring when she found it. That's the kind of hook that I, I don't, in all of my reading, it doesn't come around that often. And when it does, I was just like, whoa, where is this going? And my mind went in 25 different directions on what that might mean. Um, so did did that line come to you first and you went, oh, this would make a great book? <laughs> no, no. No. Um, that line took a long time. Uh, I had started the book and I was writing scenes and trying to develop the characters and I needed to find a way for Flora to discover, to get this piece of information that tells her that, uh, you know, everything is not as it seems. Um, and I didn't want it to be something familiar, like, you know, seeing a text that wasn't for her, or getting a letter in the mail, or, you know, I mean, those are tried and true sure. um, discovery methods. And, and I was uh, traveling with my husband, uh, and I did something I've never done in my life, which was leave my um, wedding and engagement ring in a hotel room when we checked out, and I never got them back. And the really upsetting thing about that was I had been wearing my grandmother's wedding ring as my wedding ring. Oh. And it wasn't even, it, like it was, there was nothing um, valuable about that ring. It was a, just a tiny little piece of white gold. And except to oh, me, of yeah. course, it was completely priceless. Mm -hmm. And I was really heartbroken. And I, I thought, I was thinking about it a lot and I was complaining about it a lot. And a lot of friends who I, told a story to had a story to tell me in return about some, you know, some piece of jewelry often given, you know, by a beloved aunt or a grandmother or a mother, you know, someone who was dead and that thing took on so much significance and, and then they lost it. Mm -hmm. And I just thought one morning, what if, what if I put the ring in the book? What if that's how this piece of information comes to Flora? And I had already had her at that point looking for a photograph. Um, but then I just wrote that line. You know, she wasn't looking for the ring when she found it. And when I did, I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> like, I, I know how the story is starting. And, yeah. and the other thing is as a, as a reader and as a, I, I love when authors use objects in stories and I love objects as a writer as a way to propel narrative because they really take on a power. Um, I think um, there's a quote, I'm, I don't know it exactly, but um, the writer Italo Calvino said that when you, when you put an object in a story, it becomes magic. And, and so that was also appealing to me as a writer to have that. Mm -hmm. it, when you started talking about the stories, I immediately remembered my mother's, she just had a little 10 karat gold mother's ring that my mm -hmm. brother and I had pitched in for when we were like teenagers and gotten her. Right. And she, uh, she died of early Alzheimer's and she was in a nursing home her last couple of years. And I, the ring was just something she fiddled with and yeah. it disappeared. And it Aww. was, you know, worth nothing to any 10 karat gold, right. fake little gemstones. Yeah, only but worth so much. So just what you said there, um, you yeah. bring up the story and everyone's got some way to connect to it. Yeah. And, you know, the wedding rings, especially, right. uh, no matter what they're made of or yeah. uh, how valuable they, that just, they're so precious. Well, they're already a symbol. And yeah. so, um, you know, then when something, they're, they're a really um, malleable symbol in a person's life, depending on how the marriage is, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. That line, just absolutely perfect. Uh, so you filled this book with complex characters, complicated relationships, 
um, which are, you know, that's real life, which I think is why all of this resonated so deeply with me because I, I could pull little pieces from each relationship you've got going in there and each character and relate it to somebody or something I knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the way you crafted it so brilliantly, um, did you have any characters that maybe you started out with in an earlier draft that as you went along, you're like, eh, got it. They're not going to work. I need to get rid of them. Um, I, I really didn't. I, I wanted this book to be very focused and, and unlike the nest, I didn't want to write in a million different points of view and have sort of like this story and that story and, uh, which turned out to be, uh, much harder <laughs> than, um, than having the story and that story. And, and so I never, I didn't, I don't, the only character, I had a lot more of Flora's mother in the first draft. And when my editor read it, she said, um, you know, we don't, Flora's mother isn't really in the present of the book, so we don't need that much backstory. And she was right. And the book definitely got tighter when I took some of that stuff out. But that was, that was pretty much it. There was, there was some discussion about, um, whether the character of Sydney should have a little more time in the book. And I fiddled with that a little bit, but I'm sort of happy where I landed on that. I don't want to say too much about. Right. And I, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I think so. I think you're, you're so tight with your characters and there's no, added um or extra like fluff or any everything is so tightly written um that just it makes the pages fly absolutely fly uh so you've got flora and julian who are married and they've got one child ruby and then you've got their best friends margo and david um and she's a tv actress who at one point has this a really big scene that they're filming. Mm -hmm. um, and as I'm reading this and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it kind of as an outsider, but you brought the reader into that scene where I found myself getting emotional as I was <laughs> reading it for her. And I mean, that is, that is just a gift, but what, um, what in your life were you able to draw from to make, this TV, you know, film set so authentic and, and real and bring the reader right into the middle of it. What experiences do you have with that world? Well, you know, my husband's a television writer and he has been for many years and uh, he works in late night. So I don't, um, but I, but I have been on a set a lot mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have a lot of friends who are in television and I talked to them about, you know, what it was like. I, I have, I'm, I have been on a television set while they're filming um, a, a drama, but only a couple of times. But I, I just talked to them about what it was like, like what their day was like. And, yeah. um, you know, my friends really helped me flush out the stories of all of these people, whether it was theater or television and, you know, how they felt about their jobs and how they felt about their days. And, you know, the interesting thing is it's just, it's just work when you come down to it. And yeah. in, yeah. You know, we like to glamorize what that job is, but it is really tedious. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever watched, been on set and watched a scene from a television show being made, it is, they do it over and over and over. It's, it's, it is the most tedious thing to watch. I can only imagine what it's like to have to do it, but that's their job. That's what they're trained to do. But the one time that it can be something very special is when someone's leaving. And, and so we, you know, I just talked to them about what that was like. And then it wasn't hard to put myself in Margot's shoes and think about how emotional that would be for her. Yeah. Because we've all had 
like we've all left a job, right? Where, where it feels, you know, if you, I mean, even if you are so happy to be leaving, there's always so much goodwill on that last day, you know, you, you, you want to remember the good. And um, so, but I'm glad, I'm glad it felt real to you. Uh, it did. It did. Um, it reminded me a little bit. Our family was, was a very, my, not our family, my son, my youngest was very much into the walking dead. Uh -huh. Um, I, he, he was just glued to it and he got me, you know, he got me into watching it too. And I remember every time they killed somebody off, um, the bigger of a character they were, the more glorious they made the death. Right. Um, and I remember reading that about the writers and saying, yes. you know, if they were a beloved character, we had to send them out right. And it had to be very right. memorable. Yes. You, right. you have a good death. And then, um, yeah. you know, then the opposite can happen if you're not a beloved character or if you're not a beloved actor, um, you really can get a script finding out that you die the next day. So, yeah. um, you yeah. know, there's, there is a lot of like godlike behavior <laughs> going on in those places. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you you bring in every aspect of uh, the actors, every type of acting that can be done. Um, Flora gives up her her on stage theater and in person her physical theater in order uh, to be a voice actor. Mm -hmm. which is more stable, mm -hmm. um, gives, you know, it's just more stable for her family. And again, you, you bring, you just brought me right into the world of a voice actor. Uh, so who do you know? And is that just more theater, you know, more acting friends that you were able to ask about that? Uh, cause I do know, you know, I love audiobooks, mm -hmm. and I, um, I'm a huge fan of Libro.fm, which is the mm -hmm. audiobook streaming yeah. service Me too. Me too. that benefits indie bookstores, and they are amazing. And so I've really gotten, uh, I've, I've gotten to love a good audiobook, but the narrator is just huge, huge mm -hmm. in whether or not I can listen. Yeah. So those voice actors, I mean, that's a, a gift to be able to it do. It is that. a gift. It's an incredibly difficult job, and not everyone who is an actor can do voice acting. It it it, it really requires a finesse that is. Um, if you've ever listened to audition tapes of voice actors, you understand how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, again, I just talked to my friends who are voice actors. But the other thing I did, in addition to talking to people that I knew, I. Um, you know, I listened to podcasts where actors talked about their work. I read books. I, um, you know, I did a lot of um, deep diving on Google to read interviews with voice actors. And so I didn't, it's not like I used particular things, but I just really tried to immerse myself in all of those worlds so that when I sat down to write them, I would feel a level of confidence about what I was saying. And then, of course, I had people read it and you know, said to them, is this right? Uh, you know, sure, tell me what sure. I got right and what I got wrong. So. Well, you certainly brought us right into that research with you because um, again, I felt like, I felt like an insider, you know, I didn't feel like somebody who um, was outside of the world of, of TV or voice acting. Um, I felt like I was, I was in that, that world with them. So that was incredible. Great. Um, and I loved Ruby. Ruby is an only child. She's very adaptable. Uh, she handles this move from New York city to LA beautifully. Um, and I mean, such different worlds, New York city and Los Angeles. She's also very attuned to her surroundings and incredibly, uh, sensitive to her parents' moods and mm -hmm. their relationship. I mean, mm -hmm. she sees everything that's going on. Uh, did you start out with, uh, you're going to have this only child and sh this is who she's going to be? Or did Ruby kind of evolve from the first draft to the finish? Did, did she grow as you were writing? 
Ruby showed up and she was Ruby and that never happens <laughs> to me anyway uh, with a character. It, it happened, it, it, sometimes it happens, um, not often enough, but I, I did, knew I only wanted um, Flora and Julian to have one child, partly just because it's easier. Like I said, I didn't want to write a lot of yeah. characters. And, um, and I don't, you know, um, I have a lot of, I have two sons, but I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of only children in my life. And they are, you know, it's different when you spend all of your time with your parents. Um, those kids are a little more adult and they are, very tuned into adult emotions and more so than when you know when you have siblings it's all about like what are they doing you're just kind of like locked together with your siblings and um but she was just a joy to write and i don't know every time i had to write a ruby scene she just like opened her mouth and talked to me and I don't know where she came from. And my agent said to me, is she based on someone? And I, I you know, she's not, I love teenage girls. I think they're fascinating. Um, I went to an all girls high school. So maybe there is a little bit of that sassiness, but I don't, I honestly don't know where she came from, but I'm really happy that she arrived. <laughs> she, she is fantastic. And she is a very distinct voice that that you yeah. uh, you wrote very well on. Um, another thing you you did so beautifully is at one point. So Flora is living in in Los Angeles and she returns to New York, and that that returning somewhere after a long absence where she comes up out of the subway and turns the wrong way, even though, you know, for years she, she was just on autopilot and looking at the different stores that have closed or the restaurants that have changed names, uh, you know, all of these kind of disorienting, mm -hmm. you know it, but you don't. So do you, do you have somewhere that you've returned from LA after a long time that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> Coincidentally, I lived in New York City for 27 years and then moved to Los Angeles, you know, about 10 years ago. And I go back to New York all the time. And um, it is, you know, it's, I love New York. Um, I miss it, but it, it is New York. It's changing all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you return to a place, especially for me where I got married, my kids, you know, my kids were born there. Um, they were like 11 and 14 when we moved. Um, it's like visiting my past and it's bittersweet and sometimes it's upsetting and, and then sometimes it's exhilarating. So it's just a very layered thing to uh, have a place. You know, I moved to New York City weeks after graduating from college and and so I grew up there, and and so yeah, that all that part of Flora is very much pulled from my experience. Yeah, yeah, it it came through as something personal. Again, it's another example of your writing. Um, you know, none none of your writing comes through as an outsider looking in. It's all you're you're right there with your characters. And Good Company is a perfect book club book because there is so much to unpack in these different relationships and the storyline and uh, you know where it goes and how it resolves. So when you think of a book club delving into this book, is there one part of it that you're just really anxious for them to discuss or one aspect um, I mean, if I were reading this book in a book club, it would be the marriage mm -hmm. friendship aspect. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that, as you said, there's a lot to ruminate on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think, um, I think that when you are married and you find another couple who you really click with, 
that's hard. It's um, and especially if you if you've sort of met when you're young, and then your lives, you know, everyone's lives move at a different pace, yeah. and and sometimes that brings resentment. Sometimes it brings, you know, it it just can be complicated. Yeah, I I think there are many friendships who don't uh, survive. I that, think that's true. That I, I, mean, I don't, and I and I and I don't think all friendships are supposed to survive. I think certain yeah. friendships serve you, serve mm -hmm. both parties, hopefully, um, yeah. at certain times of your life, and and then and then you move on, and that's natural. I think the ones that sort of go up and down, you know, with you, the roller coaster, those are, those are um, precious and few. I agree. And I feel like Ruby was such a cementing factor mm -hmm. for the two couples right. where, because oftentimes I feel like if, if one couple has children, and the other one doesn't, you know, right. that could be a catalyst for those friendships to, yes, if not end, then then change dramatically. But Ruby almost belonged to all of them. She um, did, yeah. Which that, is also hard. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the relationships are great. If you will indulge me, I just want to read this paragraph. Um that just absolutely blew me away. And it says, a space had opened up in her since the day she found the ring, something cavernous and scary and black. Watching Julian last night, waking up with him this morning, lying in bed and looking out the window at the clear sky, no hemlock blocking the view. She realized the space was just that, empty. She could fill it as she pleased with sorrow forgiveness, bitterness. Did you write that and then just sit back and go, I'm done. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Cause I read it and I was like, that, that's that paragraph. Myself. <laughs> Dang. That was amazing. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Um, I mean, that was one of, that was, you know, I am proud. I am proud of that paragraph, and um, and I think that is the residue of working on a book, bit by bit by bit by bit, for a couple of years, and hopefully, when you get to the end, those sorts of things start to come for you. Yep. And yeah, and that just right there could be a whole discussion point for the book club um, and yeah. what that means to them. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. I agree. So I know that uh, I know that a lot of questions are coming through from our viewers. I do want to ask uh, two, two more and I'll put them away, but okay. both Flora and Margo to some extent settled in their careers in order to provide stability mm -hmm. for their families. Um, was that an intentional, uh, intentional act and choice for you to choose those careers? Or is that something more um, that just, again, kind of evolved with the storyline? No, I mean, I always knew that I wanted the characters in the book to be in show business because I do have so many friends who who are and and because I've sort of had a front seat to that life for a long time and um, and also I'm super interested in it. And if you're when you're building the world of a book, you're going to be living in it by yourself for a long time. So it really helps to have it be something that uh, you love. Mm -hmm. And so that was definitely there from the start. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I, somebody wants to know if you, and this is a great question, uh, one I usually ask, so I'm glad somebody else thought of it. Do you visit with book clubs virtually? I, I do. I haven't, you know, the book has, hasn't been out for that long. So it's a little early for those requests to come in, but if I can, I do. Yeah. 
Wonderful. That is always good to know. So book clubs, you know, buy, buy a set of good company and uh, reach out to Cynthia through your website. Should they reach out to you that way or what is their? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All yes. right. So reach out to Cynthia through her website. Uh, if you are meeting with your book club and try and make it happen because this, this is just begging to be discussed. Absolutely begging. Um, and somebody else wants to know what was your path to publication, which is another great question. Um, well, it was um, a rather uh, late one. Um, I, I have always worked as a writer. I um, worked in New York City as a marketing and communications writer for many years. I, I really didn't start writing fiction in earnest until I was in my 40s and um, decided to go back and get my MFA in 2011. And I started The Nest at the very end of that program. And when I graduated, I probably had 100 pages of it written and spent the rest, you know, the next year finishing it. And I, I you know, I, I, I had teachers at, at Bennington who really mentored me. And when I finally, <clears throat> excuse me, when I finally had what I thought was a um, a good draft, I looked for an agent and um, found a wonderful agent, uh, Henry Dunau, and worked with him a little bit on the book. And then he had the incredibly brilliant idea to send the nest out to, uh, to editors the Monday before Thanksgiving. And he said, they will all have just spent the long weekend with their families. And then they're gonna come in on Monday and uh, read this manuscript. Yeah. And to, I think, both of our surprise, uh, it, it was, you know, um, a, lot of it, a, 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 a lot of publishing houses were interested in the book. So that was, I mean, that's a very, <laughs> that's a very concise, uh, a very concise answer to a, um, you know, 25 year journey, uh, to publishing my first book. But, um, yeah, that's what, that's what happened. It is, it is, a, it is a long and tedious road without a doubt. Um, what are you reading now or what have you read recently that you've loved? Um, well, I, um, love Catherine Heine, the writer, Catherine Heine, uh, and so Early Morning Riser oh, right is here. her uh, recent book, which mm -hmm. is uh, a wonderful story, uh, also about a couple and really about a small town and how uh, a small town comes together to support um, this family, even even when they don't always want to. Mm -hmm. um, what, why am I not prepared for this? I'm, always, I'm like looking <laughs> over at my um, early morning riser reminded me very much of Fanny flags. Uh, the whole town's talking. Yes. Yeah. It had that very small town. Like you just want to sell everything you own and move to one of these little towns and, yeah. and live with those people. I did love you? I mean, see, I did not. <laughs> As much as I love them, I just think that she, that she's such a she has such an incredible um, style to her yeah. writing. It's yeah. um, it's like simultaneously light and really piercing. I just I really that's a perfect really, way to describe it. A fan. Um, Marissa Silver has a book coming out in a couple of weeks called The Mysteries. Yes, which is yes. Um, about uh, two little girls. And I won't say a lot about it. It's a beautifully written book. It's really mm -hmm. about two families um, that these two girls bring together, and um, that's great. I'm 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 reading some galleys right now. Um, I'm yeah. reading Fellowship Point by Alice Elliot Dark, um, who has not published a book in many years, but she wrote the uh, short story in the gloaming that is very famous and was made into a. a a movie and she has been working on this book for a very long time and it's a big book. So, uh, that's, that's kind of what I've been reading. Yeah. At the well, moment. 
So with all the reading and all the promoting this, have you started working on your next book or are you going to take another little break? I, um, I ha have known what the next book is going to be really since I started Good Company. Um, so I, it's been percolating in my head for a while. I haven't actually started working on it. I've started researching it and I've sort of started um, reading around it. So I am, I am reading, I'm rereading a lot of books that I think might help me get into, uh, figure out the structure of the book. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, so are you more like Flora or Margot? Um, or I, think I say is who, who is more you? I, I think if you smash them together, you get me. So um, I am at different times. I am like both of them. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, and I had, hang on, I have to look. So I thought I had one, one other. Oh, somebody else, somebody else wants to know, um, do you have a favorite line from Good Company? Um... Well, I'm quite fond of the first line since it took me so long to come up with it, but it also always makes me laugh whenever, um, whenever I read, you know, you, when you, right before you publish a book, you have to read it over and over and over and yeah. over again until you are convinced it's the worst book anyone ever wrote. Um, but there's a line where, um, where Ruby tells um, her mother, Flora, that, um, dairy is basically like poison at her age. And that always makes me um, laugh. I like that. <laughs> I did. So somebody wants to know um, the series that's in production. Are you involved with that at all? It's or not in production. Um, it is, it has been op. It has just recently been optioned. Um, the, the Nest was in development at Amazon as a movie for some years, and I felt like that was not going to happen. So when the option expired in February, I took it back. Okay. And uh, so that it's, so it has only just been optioned by AMC. Uh, I haven't even signed the paperwork yet, <laughs> but they are very close to hiring a writer for the pilot, which is exciting because um, that at least means um, you know, they're trying. Yeah. So, yes. And, and I, and I will be involved if it actually does go to series. Excellent. I, I imagine, I, I can't imagine how hard that would be not to be involved with your baby. Uh, and I, it looks like we have one final question. Barbara wants to know what was your favorite book as a young reader? Great question. I really loved the Anne of Green Gables books. They were my um, obsession, you know, as a young reader. I, I, we would go to Toronto. I grew up in Rochester, New York, and we would go to Toronto um, often for vacation. And, you know, you could get like maybe the first two or three of those series in my hometown, but not the rest of them. And every year I'd wait to go to the bookstore in, in Eaton's Mall in Toronto and get the next one. And I would just sit in the hotel room the whole time reading it. So those books were hugely influential on me. I think just a, um, a young girl who wanted to write so much and, and, and put some, you know, had some, gave so much credit to having an imagination and uh, looking at the world through that lens. So those were, yeah, those books are very dear to me. Oh, Sarah McCoy says, hello, kindred. Yes. <laughs> what a beautiful memory to spending, you know, going in as a girl to the bookstore and, and yeah. getting that next wonderful I book. I could not wait for the next one. And um, yeah. So lovely. Well, and this has been absolutely, oh no. It's just I was just going to say the Anne of Green Gables people, like whenever you meet one, it's, it's, it's an instant connection. Yes. I love it. Love it. Love it. 
this has been so, so much fun. Thank you so much for letting me just pick your brain about this book because uh, I could talk about it for hours. And I know Thank book you. clubs are going to want to do that. Um, absolutely. Book clubs, Mother's Day, your best friend's birthday, um, you know, all of those things, your sister, it, all, all those people are going to love this book. So thank you. Thank you thank both you. so much for being here. Great job, ladies. I'm going to go buy 50 more copies. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining Bye. the Blades tonight.